Okay, let's get started now. Uh, finally, I get a handle over the technology. I hope I can do it. I can remember this next time when we start. So, markets in action. By the way, do you have any questions? Okay, leave them to uh, seminar cloud, sorry. <laughs> because it's only one hour lecture, so I don't think uh, asking questions right now would be a wise idea. So why don't we leave it to the seminar time and then half of the class will learn from you. The other half probably will find out later because we have two sp split seminars. Okay, so uh, elasticities. Uh, we use elasticity in economics to, well, we apply elasticity in economics and business to measure the reaction of uh, customers to changes in price or changes in our indicators, whatever indicators you have. So changes in, uh, in let's say, financial indicators, uh, changes in uh, stock prices usually gets investors reacted. They get excited about stock price increases. It's a good news. Uh, they get depressed about stock price declines because they lose investment in, in declines. So how about the customers? How many of you get depressed if the iPhone goes up by 100% in price? You see, quite a few, I guess. Of course, you have to be an iPhone addict for that one to happen. Usually, we have iPhone addicts uh, queuing up at 5 o'clock for the 9 a.m. launch of a new phone, right? Or it's a day ahead, so sometimes, isn't it? They have tents set up there and sitting there. Okay, anyway, so this elasticity measures basically this sort of reaction. So what happens if say, uh, B changes to A, yeah? What happens, uh, something changes to, uh, when, when our, I mean, what happens to our product's demand, for example, when some parameters change in our model? In economics, we build models and try to uh, estimate the, uh, the values using, for example, elasticity model. Yeah, it's application of basic algebra in, uh, in economics. So, uh, starting with this general idea, elasticity basic, basically measures the uh, effect of uh, B on A when B changes. It's like a slope coefficient. Isn't it? You have rise over uh, run for your effect. But elasticity is a slightly different measure here. We're looking at percentages. So, when we apply it to economics, this will be, let's say, most, most common one is the price elasticity of demand. You can have price elasticity of supply, you can have advertising elasticity of demand, or you can have um, some other something elasticity of demand. Say, product future changes and what's elasticity of demand with respect to the change of that product future, for example. The weight of uh, a product changes and what's the demand elasticity, for example. Have you seen the shrinkage in the boxes of chocolates usually? That, that's something we ignore. So, if you remember the Celebrity, was it celebration, sorry. A cup of chocolates used to be a kilogram for two pounds or something like that. Today, you pay five pounds for 650 grams, right? But over the past couple of years now, not going that far, I noticed that the uh, five pound is the price, but originally the weight was 750 grams. This year, it's 650 grams. Price is five pounds. It's just the top shrank, the, the box shrank, so the weight of the chocolates Frank, the amount you're getting for a pound is now declined. If you notice that that's, that's actually kind of inflation, isn't it? Prices have risen. Reason, I should say. <laughs> Prices have risen by, by a certain percentage point there. That's obviously, we ignore it. It's, we still inelastically demand them because it's a necessity for some of us. We need the chocolates for staying up for the, uh, before the exams. Or something. Okay, so how do we then measure? There are two different methods that we cover in this class. We don't use a calculus. Is calculus method as well? If you want to, uh, if you're using functional forms of demand, then you can use calculus to measure the uh, gradient in this in this curve. But look at the simple one, and that's called R price elasticity. It measures reaction of uh, quantity demanded to price changes. That's why the numerator is quantity demanded, denominator is the price. See, this is not a complicated formula, is it? Easy, so you have changing quantity demanded over average. So this is also, for example, midpoint, and here, 
the trend in price over the average. And the definitions are given here. So I'm going to skip that quickly. Not a difficult one, is it? OK, so here's an example now. If you think that's not difficult, that's good. Um, say that uh, price at point M, we have a coordinate P8 and coordinate 10. At 8 pounds, we demand 10 units. <coughs> at point N, that's when the price <coughs> declines. So we reduce the price to 6 pounds. And now that it's lower price, the quantity demanded is higher. Make sense? This is law of demand, yeah? As the price of a commodity declines, quantity demanded increases. It's a movement along the curve. Now, using the midpoint approach, this is also called arc method, you can easily find the difference here, find the price difference, and plug in the numbers, and you have something called... Uh, elastic demand. Now, about eight of you said you had economics, so what do we infer from this result? It's a Sorry, say it again? Normal. It's a normal good? It's I'm jumping, you're taking a quick elastic. hit. Elastic yes, that makes sense. It's a highly elastic demand, isn't it? It's Kind of, maybe normal good. We don't know whether this is a normal good or not, because we are not taking the elasticity with respect to income. This is with respect to price. price. So we, we don't confuse them in the exam especially. Yeah? Don't write normal good when you see a high elasticity. Now, it is negative, but we take absolute value usually. So take the absolute value. It's negative because demand is always downward sloping. So what I said always, but it's not necessarily. So I have to be careful because sometimes the words that I say here, and I mean, may uh, may lead to confusion. It's not always negative. Uh, sorry, downward sloping. Sometimes they are positive as well. Um, does anyone have an example of positive sloping demand? Say for a product. What sort of products will have uh, a positive sl sl slope demand? If not, that's okay. We're running out of time. But think about them. There is a there is a group of sort of type of goods for which demand is usually positively sloped. Maybe we haven't experienced that in our life. That's why probably we cannot bring up an example, but some of you may if you become investment bankers soon. Point elasticity. This is the second one that we usually use, but most likely won't come in your exam. Point elasticity is just elasticity at a point on a curve, on a demand curve. All you need here is this change in demand, point of demand and change in price, and the point Coordinate, I mean, coordinates of the point, or the demand curve, P1 coordinate and P1 coordinate. Yeah, one. Uh, so that means we need three, uh, three quantity demanded. Demand what do you mean? Uh, uh, quotes. Oh, you, you need, need, you need the change in quantity, yeah. demanded change in price, and just the point. Yeah, just one point is enough. You mean the parameters, I suppose. Yeah, because, yeah. Know, yeah, for the Three change. parameters, yeah. yeah okay. So, now, um, I don't have the thing. Right, here it is. Let's say we have demand curve. So looking at the price elasticity of demand at this point, say this is P1, Q1, what's the price elasticity? Usually it's the infinitesimal small change in price, and we're looking at the reaction in the quantity demand, yeah? We don't usually use this. In case you do, I will tell you. It's the arc elasticity, and, and I will upload some reading material for why we use arc elasticity. It, there's, a, there's a valid reason, there's an interesting reason for, for that as well. But when you apply in a master's level, when you, use, uh, when you are in a master's level course, economics course, you will be doing maybe third year, maybe you'll be doing economics in the third year. Then you will take, uh, uh, you will have examples with from calculus, uh, application of calculus in economics, where you take the uh, derivative of a demand function to get the point elasticity. So you measure the point, uh, uh, usually the uh, slope of a curve at a point. Um, that's something you can do later. So what are the categories of elasticities? We usually get a, economists usually get a, get a value out of the model. And elasticity can take a, a values between uh, 
well, how to say this? It's from minus infinity to zero. In absolute terms, it's zero to plus infinity. So usually we don't take the sign as as a as an indicator in price elasticity only because there are two types of elasticity for which we need to take the sign as indicator of certain qualities. Yeah. So for price elasticity, I forgot to put the absolute modulus here, but now you can see that this is zero to one, so it's all all worked out well here in these slides. So ignore the sign, guys. Yeah, in the elasticity, just look at the magnitude. How large is the number? So uh, demand is large, uh, relatively elastic if elasticity with respect to price is greater than one. Just like the example one you said, you saw two point what, two point five. Um, it's relatively inelastic if the value is between zero and one. Um, one thing I forgot to put is usually this thing is equal in some books, but we assume that unitary elastic demand is not included as uh, relatively inelastic. It's unitary elasticity. It's a special kind of elasticity which is called unitary, uh, unitary elasticity or unit elasticity, I should say. So the equal sign is sometimes there in some books for some reason. Um, then you have the unitary elasticity of demand that's equal one. We'll give you then. Uh, I'll give you an example of the graphs in a minute. And perfect elasticity is just a large number usually. It's infinity. And you have also perfect inelasticity equal to zero. So perfect inelasticity means no reaction to change in price. Here is an example with the application of unit elasticity, perfect inelastic demand and perfect elastic demand here. Now again, you see this time we have the sign. That's what I was afraid of. In the sense that that positive slide and then switch to negative. So hopefully you get your head around it. It's basically absolute value. Take the absolute value, yeah? ignore the signs. Um, if the demand is uh, perfectly or totally, that's some books using uh, total as well, by the way, totally inelastic, then the demand curve is straight line. Yeah? We demand this product so much so that it's a necessity or otherwise we die. So we just have to consume this quantity no matter the price is. That's the meaning of perfect inelastic demand. So any example? And what was rice? Rice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a kilogram of rice. I'll sell it for a thousand pounds. Will you buy it? <laughs> you see, kilogram will cost you a thousand pounds. Will you buy it? I think so. so that's you want some situation. I think it's your phone number. <laughs> no, this is not situation. Okay, go ahead. Water, yes. We won't have. What else do you have without water? Mm -hmm. Everything is out made of water, isn't it? Then all liquids. <laughs> Anything else? Space tourism is booming now. If you live in Mars, say on Mars, so Elon Musk will take you to Mars, and then how is it there? If your oxygen supply is getting lower, what do you do? You're ready to pay any money for a for an oxygen supply problem, yeah? So he's gonna price you huge amounts. He's gonna tell you huge, uh, he's gonna quote you a big price for supply of oxygen. So that's probably the closest we can come to uh, perfect elastic, uh, inelastic demand case. Um, these are difficult, but I think you should be able to work out something for this one. What about infinitely elastic or perfectly elastic demand for a product? What sort of products command perfect elasticity? iPhones. iPhones. I think um, mm -hmm. at the given price, you can buy any, any amount. So a little change in the price means big reduction in quantity demanded in this case, because it's just slight tilt in this demand curve makes it very elastic demand. Now, right now, it's perfectly elastic. Slight tilt means huge difference in the quantity demanded. So the good is already expensive. A little bit higher price makes uh, reduce it, uh, uh, quantity demanded by a huge amount. So the, the closest probably are the luxury goods that poor people would want to buy, for example. Yeah, low income people want to buy. But it's very hard to come up with a, a perfect example like we had earlier for this case. Now you also have this sort of 
good for which demand is unit elastic. At any point here, and at any change in price, the quantity demanded is proportional to the same, basically. This remains the same, basically. So if you see this, uh, what's this here? Um, at this point, the revenue is 100, is it? Yeah, 80. Yeah, at this point, you have an 80 pound expenditure. So you buy 40 units at 20 pound each. That's the area is basically 80. And changing the price to 8 implies a higher demand. But when you multiply 100 by 8 to get the expenditure, you get 800, oh, 800 and 800, sorry. So the, the expenditure is the same. That's only because elasticity along the curve is always 1. It's unit elastic. Unlike here, you see, if you have a perfect inelastic good, people will have to buy a certain amount regardless of the price, so your revenue goes up. Yeah? But here, that's a different case. Yeah, if you raise the price a little bit, you get a reduction. You get a reduction in the quantity demanded. Now, we will see the application in a minute. I think it's in, a, in, in the slide after this one, I think. Okay. Now, in a linear demand curve, this is normal, say, uh, normal elastic demand, or elastic, just accepted as demand curve. At the higher prices, demand is elastic. So change here, so reduction from P1 to P2, will have an elastic response, higher response in quantity demand decline, for example. While in the lower part here, the change in price this little change in quantity because the product is already cheap. So reducing the price by a bit doesn't induce more customers to purchase or reduce the purchase. Or increasing the price by a bit doesn't affect your quantity demand much. So think of salt. It's 50p a pack. If it goes to a pound a pack, you will still buy the same quantity, right? This is the low price already. But if iPhone is already 1,000 pounds, it goes up by 100 more, 10% increase, for example. 1,100. You will think twice before you buy it, yeah? Yeah, so the, I, so the price, when the prices are higher for a good, the elasticity is usually high. When the prices are lower for a good, the elasticity is even low. So for this reason, along the demand curve, not the demand itself, it's the demand curve, along the demand curve, elasticity, Changes from high to low, at some point there will be unit elastic point. We'll come to that as well. Keep this in mind, this is something that's, uh, uh, that's going to come in your, uh, probably in your exam, either it's in the main one or is it one. So what determines the elasticity of demand? What affects the elasticity of demand? Um, ease of substitution. Goods with uh, substitutions or rival products or rivals, will usually have elastic demand. Yeah, we can quickly switch. That means reduce our demand for the other good when the prices go up. Yeah, we can easily change. But if the good doesn't have substitute, perfect substitute, let's say, we really have to consume it no matter what the price is. Yeah, like the uh, electricity, gas, substitution is very hard for them, especially at this in this age, when we have everything all, uh, running on electricity. We still buy it, we consume more or less the same amount even if the price is double. Yeah, we may consume a bit less, but because of the substitutability of this good with something else is low. So we, we still consume utility. All proportion of total expenditure, for example, affects the elasticity of a good as well, demand of a good as well. If you're already spending so much on, on a product, and the price changes, you might think, I'm already spending so much, why should I pay extra? So you will change your demand, for example, for that. So that affects demand elasticity. Or if, you, if the product that you're buying uh, requires a very small, tiny fraction of your income to be spent a month, for example, you may not, you may not even think about it. Yeah? It's too small, a price increase, so you keep buying. So it really depends. So elasticity depends on the uh, proportion of income you're spending on the product. Any questions? So, length of time. Initially, if price rises, for example, for oil today, 50%, for example, by 
we don't have probably choice in the short run. We just have to drive to work today. Or a week, maybe we have to still drive to work. But then we switch to electric cars. In the long run, we will change to sell the car and get an electric car or something else, yeah? So the length of time also affects our decision to buy or not to buy. Decision to consume certain goods. So it affects the elastic schedule initially. Price changes do not have much effect on the quantity demanded, but over time people switch. You know, in the 70s and 80s, there was an OPEC embargo on the Western oil uh, supply. So this OPEC was made up of all these Arab countries and a couple of other countries. When Arabs were not happy with the Israeli uh, assistance of Americans to Israel, in the war they put embargo on America and the US, uh, the UK, such that they stopped supplying oil. In the U.S., the price of petrol went up quickly, over a day, over a couple of days, I should say, because they usually use the reserves at the low prices, but eventually they ran out of reserves and the price went up so much that people who had to drive, had to drive at, buy the petrol at the high price. But eventually, what happened is that big, oversized trucks became smaller, more efficient. You see, over time now, we have electric cars now, yeah? Usually Americans like having two cars, one pickup and one family car. So they started changing one to more efficient car. So in case the oil price goes up, they drive the efficient car. If not, then they drive the other one, depending on the situation. So they, they adopted it. So they, they adapted to the situation. And that affects the demand for a good. And durability of product, for example, if the product can be prepared or it can postpone the purchase, then affects the elasticity. So if you aren't going into the market, then someone else is also probably not going into market, and fewer people buy it, that affects the elasticity again. Yeah? So the type of product you look at also is, is something that affects the, uh, elas the elasticity. Now, this is a bit theoretical now. This will be our uh, thought experiment. Say that we have an initial equilibrium point, point uh, A, and we would like to know how, uh, how supply movements or impacts on supply affects the price in two situations. First, we look at it when the demand is relatively inelastic, as it is now, and we also look at the reaction of uh, quantity demand to price change when the demand is elastic. So say that we started at that point and something happened and the uh, supply shifted inwards. What could this be? Hmm? Yeah, what, what happened? To, why, why would supply decrease? Natural disasters, possibly, yes, and? Price of Raw materials, yeah? yeah? Price of the product that, well, price of the raw materials that are input into this product, yeah? And that induces the supply to go back, which means a movement along the demand curve. So the price is rising now. So many things could happen, but in the, in the seminar we'll discuss that. So that will be our new, new point. Not the change in the quantity due to change in price. When the, uh, when the demand curve is inelastic, the higher price rises do not have much, as much effect in the quantity. Because this must be something necessary. Right, guys? Even if the price went up by so much, the quantity demand declined, but not as, as much as that one. Now, what if the demand curve so forget about the first one, I chased it, is it elastic. The same shift then would have different effect. So that's the uh, point here now. Yeah, the price increase from P1 to P3, very slight, uh, tiny increase, let's say, tiny increase, induced that huge change in quantity demanded. Because the demand curve was elastic, which means the good is, is not a necessity or something that we usually don't require on a daily basis. So maybe restaurant eating 
e-talks, for example, um, iPhone, this computers, your car, something like this. Yeah. So the price rises in these cases induce huge uh, effects. Now, next, let's look at an actual application of uh, elasticity in decision making in business. So let's start that. Uh, let's assume that we have uh, a good uh, that we consume three units of three units when the price is two pounds then the total expenditure would then be a area of this rectangle now decision to ra raise the prices or not should really be based on our uh, products demand elasticity, uh, price elasticity of demand. Companies usually don't know how elastic they are, in terms of values, how elastic their demand for products. But theoretically we can figure out or give a case in which uh, we should be, uh, how, how we, sh how we should uh, make a decision in these cases. Say that uh, uh, demand is elastic and if the prices rise, Total revenue goes down usually. So look at this now, this, this uh, case. If the price rises from four pounds to five pounds, even the elastic curve, what happened is that initially this was the total revenue, so that's 20 times four, 80 pounds. As soon as the price rose, our new demand, quality demand is 10 units per time, five pounds. So 10 units are demanded at five pounds. So the Revenue is now 20 pounds. What, what happened is that we lost this area. We just gained a little. So when a product is elastically demanded, raising the price is not a good idea, apparently, for businesses. So instead, what should we do? If you want to increase our revenue, we should reduce the price. So reduce it from five to four. Initially, that's the revenue. But when you reduce the price to four pounds, that's how much you get now. So you gain that area and lose that area. So the companies that are selling goods with elastic demand should actually reduce the prices instead of increasing them. Make sense? But in a unitary case, if the product is, uh, if it's demand for, is uh, unit elastic, then usually we should do whatever we can because the rise will result in exactly the same rise amount, proportionally the same amount of, of or I should say, when the price rise by a pound, the demand declines by a unit, so exactly the same amount, so one to one. Now, what about inelastic demand case? This is an inelastic, relatively inelastic demand case. It's not necessarily inelastic, but relatively inelastic, yeah? Starting at four pounds, that is our revenue. Raising the price by eight, uh, two to eight pounds by four pounds, say, is inducing a slight decrease in decline in quantity. But then what we gain here is that losing that much and gain big amounts. So when the demand is inelastic, raising the, if you want a high revenue, raising the price makes sense. Because we, we just lose a bit of few customers, but then that compensates or overcompensates the the price overcompensates the loss in the quantity sales. Yeah? So the inelastically demanded uh, goods are like cigarettes. Raising the price implies more income there. People will have to buy them, right? In many cases, they will have to buy them. in most instances. But today we have substitutes. So, yeah, these e cigarettes, they have a good substitute, then the price is rise. So, however, reducing the price won't increase our revenue because reduction from eight to four means a little bit of gain but big loss. So uh, the goods with low prices but in elastic demand can be uh, can have high prices over time. Should be increased. In, their price should be increased by businesses in case they want to if they want to earn high revenue. So it's a it's a case of uh, revenue maximization objective. If the business wants to maximize their revenue, they should consider raising their prices, given that their demand, their product's demand is inelastic. But if the product's demand is, I should say, inelastic, 
if the product demand is elastic, they should actually reduce the price. That helps them raise the revenue or increase the revenue. Any questions on this? Yeah. It's just unitary elastic value. I thought um, inelasticity is less than one case, so you can't really say. Uh, in some books, however, I saw that the uh, um, inelastic case included equality, but I don't think it's the case because inelasticity should really be less than one. So perhaps they had a justification for that. I don't remember which piece, but I, I do remember that this was an equality as well. So there's no such thing as inelasticity if the value is equal to one. It has to be less than one usually. Okay, good question. Any any other questions? Yeah. What is if the company increases the price and it decreases on the side? Decrease? Decrease them against the Increase and decrease. What do you mean? Uh, so when they increase the price, the Impact on revenue really depends on the elasticity of the demand. So I, you saw the case here, but if they reduce it back, you mean? Yeah. To the original? Yes, to the original price. Well, I don't have an answer to that, to be honest. Maybe I didn't understand your question. So do you have a case? Maybe you have a case. That's yeah. what I'm asking. All companies have their products increased to ridiculous price, and then they sign their own sign. <laughs> yes. They don't do any sale, they just increase it. Your price and ridiculous, but they Yes, yes, I see your point now. I don't think you're looking at the density here, you're just looking at the uh it's a sense what do you call this advertising method? They just show that the, the, the product is high quality, but then they do discounts to show as if they are actually doing Black Friday discounts. No. That happens usually on the Black Friday. Or January sales. I, I, that's a good point, actually. I used to work for a clothing uh, retailer um, in central London, and uh, by Christmas sales, we would get a special stock for sale. They would have pre printed tickets showing us 100 pounds, it is to 80 pounds. But that was the original price. Then they do further reduction, which is actually the proper discount now. You see the and then we would remove the regular stock, put the sales stock. So it's a special sales stock. So this is psychological sort of uh, uh, strategy that affects people's what you call preferences or tastes. You know, people would come and say, "Okay, I want to buy this." Uh, this we would have to tell that this actually is the actual reduction in price. In fact, I was lying. To be honest with you, I was just telling them that I never saw that product before. It just comes in with the pre-printed manufacturer, uh, factory pre-printed tickets. And I would say this was used to be £1,000, now it's £500. That was lying. But I was told to do that, so we had to go ahead. It was a, it was a I don't want to tell the name, but it was a luxury uh, trench coat maker. So you probably know, know it by now. Figure out what it is. They had a, a men's suit section where this thing would happen. And very rarely, the regular ones would be on sale, if anything, it would be 20%. Mm -hmm. Others would go down to 70 which are usually sales stock. You wouldn't see them outside the Christmas period or summer sale. OK, that's, that's not obviously. I mean, that's probably the late, because the demand for them is, uh, is positive. So, you know, the more expensive the luxury good, the, the more we want to buy it to show. I paid a higher price for that one. Yeah? I mean, if you go to. Uh, Bond Street, probably, you will probably want to buy more expensive of the two goods when they show you two goods. Okay, how about the, uh, you know, you know, now this is a bigger picture here. Um, this basically is the, co uh, these are copies. So the change in quantity traces the change in quantity here. Notice that, as I said earlier, but at the high prices, the elasticity is high for price elasticity is high for a product. At some point, there is a unit elasticity right in the middle, apparently, and then, then in the lower part, you have an elastic demanded part. So, as the when the when the price is already high, usually we have low demand, low demand quantity demanded. 
But as we reduce the price, quality demand increases, which means the total revenue goes up. As we reduce the price, our quantity demand increases, total revenue increases. At some point, no effect at this point. Remember the if the gas is unity, no any change will result in the same revenue. So they will get a flat top here, a bit flat top, the maximum point. And then beyond it, the good is, is now inelastically demanded. Prices are lower. So reducing further means lower revenue. So in fact, at this if, if you're selling in this region, you should actually think of raising the price so that total revenue goes up. Even if the quantity goes down, the higher prices compensate for the loss of quantities. So, in economics, we usually apply calculus to find this maximum point, but usually the revenue curve would be a, some funky curve, and you can apply some virtues and uh, differential equation to get the point here. I think you do the, uh, you may have used the Lagrange multipliers, no, we can't? Okay, maybe next year. To find the maximum and minimum points. So we apply that idea here. So this is our parabola. And we, we take the derivative of the parabola and find out what at which point the, uh, the function re reaches its maximum point. Um, elasticity examples now. Coffee in the short run is inelastically demanded. Ignore the sign. Yeah? It's less than one, so it's inelastically demanded. But in the long run, it's not that much. We will still have some substitutes, but that's still inelastic, isn't it? So coffee appears to be a uh, like, like a drug. Yeah. If you addicted to it, kitchen and household appliances are inelastically demanded. Um, meals at restaurants are. Very much elastic. When the prices go up, there we rather scoop at home. We have substitute in other words. For this, it's rare coffee or kitchen appliances. Um, air travel, large elasticity is quite high here. You can drive in the US, especially. Driving is a, uh, out of, not out of fashion there. And US oil demand, however, was you see this very small value, close to zero, almost perfect elastic. Inelastic, I should say. Perfectly inelastically demanded oil. That's because the US is has the highest number of cars per capita. They have lots of cars. And one time it was a couple of two cars. So they, they and they don't have this public transport. So in their cities they don't have this. And so to go to school they will have to take the car, there's no bus. Unless some rich state provides the yellow buses to do that, usually it doesn't happen. Um, in the long run, however, we are substituting at times, so the inelasticity is a bit lower. Uh, or uh, with the reduction in the inelasticity, we can, we can manage without the cars. Now, a new concept now, cross price elasticity. Again, this is a ratio. It measures the reaction of quantity demanded for a good A when the price of the quantity demanded, sorry, price of the B changes. Cross price elasticity. You see that. Numerator has A, denominator has B, these are two different goods. We just measuring the response of uh, quantity demanded for good A when the price of the quantity demanded, uh, sorry, price of the B changes. I keep saying quantity demanded. Right, so, um, but uh, that says percentage. We usually use arc price elasticity again, arc cross price elasticity. So that is quantity over price change. <coughs> Yep, that's the formula we'll be using, and you will not get the formula in the exam, so it's not difficult to memorize as well anyway. Now, in cross-price elasticity, um, sign matters, so we don't take we don't take absolute values here. Sign matters because if the sign of elasticity, cross-price elasticity value is positive, then that implies goods are okay. Maybe I had the wrong idea about it. Yes, they are subject. They are com uh, competitive goods. Yes, sorry, it's my uh, English being my second language. I confused it. So goods become well, goods are substitutes because let's say you are drinking Pepsi Cola and suddenly its price went up by uh, two hundred percent. You may switch to Coca Cola now. 
So the demand for Coca-Cola rose while the price of Pepsi-Cola declined. Or the rose again, I should say. So there's a positive increase and positive increase. You're dividing positive by positive gives you positive result. Make sense? Or say that the uh, demand for but uh, sorry, price for, price of butter increased. So there's a positive rise, positive change. What would you do? You would most likely buy margar margarine. So demand for margarine rises as the price for butter rises. So there's a positive demand over positive price change. So that's positive result, yeah? Margarine, I don't know how substitutable it is, but not for eating of you, for consuming. It's probably adding as an ingredient into your bread making <laughs> or machine or whatever it is. So, and when the, uh, the uh, sign is negative, you have uh, indication of uh, complementarity between the two goods, A and B. Um, any example of complementary goods? Yes, they usually go together. Toothpaste and toothbrushes. Yes, toothpaste and toothbrushes, car and tires, or so oil and car, uh, cartridge and printers. So these are complements. They complement each other and they are. Uh, so a, a price increase in the toothpaste, uh, sorry, toothbrush may, well, that's probably a bad example because. <laughs> This is a very small amount of increase. Isn't it? So price increase in oil, for example, you consume a lot of oil if you're driving. So high prices in oil reduce demand for cars. You see, price increase in oil is positive, but demand for cars is negatively declining. Isn't it? It's declining. So there's a negative over positive gives us a negative result. So science matter in this elasticity measure. So keep that in mind. I think uh, there's also uh, Good substitute or bad substitute idea. So, a, a pro products are good substitute or complements if the value is larger than 0 0.5. So, you might get 2, that's a very good substitute, for example. You might get 0 0.3, that's not, the, not a good substitute. There must be another substitute. So, A and B may not be substitute. Maybe there is a C product, yeah, product C, that, that would command a higher, uh, higher cost price elasticity. So, keep that in mind too. Um, uh, some examples, take a look, guys. Beef and pork, chicken, these are good substitutes, usually. Um, but it looks like, in actuality, in reality, it may not be the cases. Um, but in my life, in my own uh, practice, I would say, I usually uh, switch between chicken and beef, depending on the price. But when we take everyone else, on average, that may not be the case, apparently. On average, people may not have, uh, uh, may not have, may not think that they may not substitute for the price because of price rises between these products. And income elasticity. This is where we talk about whether the good is normal or inferior or superior. Elasticity with respect to income for a, for a product is basically change in income or uh, sorry, change in quantity demanded or change in income. So it measures uh, how, by how much the quantity demanded changes when uh, uh, income changes by one percentage point. So. Here's just a graphical example. Say that uh, usually as we uh, say we have some good, good X that we consume. As our income rises, what happens is that we consume more of it. But at some point, between a Y2 and Y1 range of income, we will keep consuming the amount that we consumed earlier. So we don't want any more of it, but we still buy it. But as we become richer, the demand for that product goes down. So we consume less of it. So in this region, if the reaction of demand, quality demand is positive to our income rises, it's a normal good. I don't know what to call it, zero income elasticity, basically. And inferior, it's, it's an inferior good if we are super wealthy and we don't want it anymore. Yeah? The quality demand declines. Um, does anyone have an example of this type of good in which you 
buy initially more of it, but then eventually you decide not to buy them, and you substitute out. You buy something else as you become rich. So you are a student now, and I suppose some of you are some of you are working part time, and as you re get richer and richer, you probably buy more of it. But at some point, you become so rich, and you say, "Okay, I want to buy a substitute, buy more expensive ones." So demand for the product goes down. Maybe the supermarkets own brands, cheaper ones, isn't it? Value brands. You buy more of it as you become richer, but then at some point, you say, "I want to buy." Basmati rice now, yeah? Not the, <laughs> the other rice. So the rice is an example. Um, baked beans are examples. You may buy a bit more when you earn more, but then at some point you choose to eat more, uh, more uh, sausages. Say, you just reduce the demand for baked beans, yeah? So, however, not that inferior good doesn't, important thing is that inferior good doesn't be in low quality. It's just, as you become richer, you consume less of it. Yeah, it's not the quality case. Yeah? You may have Gucci bag, but as you become much more richer, you may buy a bit more expensive. What's the expensive one? The girls? What's the. What's more? Chanel. Baby Chanel. You buy Chanel now. So you, you, you substitute away Gucci with Chanel and you create a collection of. You have a collection of Chanel products now, so you demand more of that as you as you as you get richer. And so this is your lifetime. This is an example of your life experience, I guess. Right now you are somewhere there. Income is a bit certain level. It's learning, but then at some point you earn more. Obviously, you may graduate and you get a full time job, but it's low paid. Now you are you are some banker here. So your demand will go down. Yes or a uh, pension fund manager kind of thing. So um, there's another way of explaining these things. We have inferior goods to which our income rises and quantity demand declines, so that's negative slope. Normal goods usually have a positive slope, but then there's something called superior goods. The value of superior, elasticity of superior goods will usually get more than one. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a huge jump as our income rises. So maybe we're already buying Luxury goods, but then we become more wealthier, so wealthier, then, then we buy more of that product. That superior case. Yeah. Usually, that superior is not shown in basic uh, economics, but just in case, I just decided to include it. Some examples of income elasticities, if you don't have any questions. So, short run income elasticity is usually, really, some months short run is some months long run. We, we don't really have specific measure. Yeah? We can change uh, from good, our tastes and preferences change very quickly sometimes. And sometimes people keep buying the same thing for a longer time. And then once they change, that's their short run. And then they make other further decisions later on. That will be their long run. Yeah? It really depends. But generally, short run income elasticity of foods is apparently 0.5. Restaurant meals are point. Six. So these are restaurant means are superior goods compared to uh, uh, food expenditure. Oh, sorry, food that we cook in that time, for example. Yeah. Have a read of this. Um, any more examples of income elasticity that are uh, sorry inferior goods income elasticity? Any examples? Hard to find one. Okay, we'll give one example here. It looks like there's one example in millions of examples. So look at this one. Cigarettes have a downward sloping demand curve with respect to income. That's interesting. What does it mean then when you have a negative income elasticity value? It's an inferior good. Why is it inferior good? Why do we consume less of it when you become richer? Maybe we switch to cigars, yeah? More expensive ones, like the rap rappers. They are from poor families usually. They smoke whatever they can find initially, but then as they become richer and richer, they now switch to cigars, yeah? Um, so everything else combines a huge positive value. So this mostly these are normal goods, and this is superior good, car. 
metals, for example, and you have imported goods, imports. Most of the Chinese goods right now, isn't it? They have higher income elasticity. <laughs> um, I guess this includes everything, not necessarily Chinese. I just usually like to say China because it's a superpower now in terms of economy, military, or space. And the uh, last few bits are the demand elasticities. You can measure the demand elasticity with respect to advertising expenditures. So you, you could say uh, change in quantity demand and over change in advertising expenditure. This is done for, market, by, for marketing purposes to see how effective was our uh, uh, advertising campaigns. So you take uh, advertising spending last year and this year, you take the demand last year and this year, calculate the elasticity to see if there is a greater than one value. If there is a greater than one value, that means advertising expenditure was uh, effective. So long as it's positive. For interest rates, for population size, for example, you can measure the demand for goods with respect to population change. Tesco can do that before they open another store. So they take a store, measure the sales today, measure it next year, and then measure the population in the same year, and the measure it following year, for example, and then see by how much the demand for Tesco or food flow changes, for example. And then based on that, if it's a huge increase, they will open another shop nearby. So, yeah. so these are the applications of these sort of elasticities. In, but these are very basic applications usually, isn't it? They probably have much more sophisticated statistics there to look at. Um, lastly, elasticity of supply, you'll have the same ideas here. So I'm not going to cover it because you're there now. It's only two slides more left here. And please read the book. It has a, a bit lengthy introduction to supply elasticity. The same principles apply. We just discussed them, yeah? It's the same principle. Slightly, a few, few things change. But anyway, uh, done for today. Any questions before we leave? If not, I'll see you today, some of you today in the class, some of you on Thursday. Thank you.